Um, so welcome back everyone. Um, we're about to start our afternoon session of the workshop um, and we're going to be shifting from our focus this morning on systemic resilience <clears throat> where we had a look at the political and economic context of resilience uh, in, in giving a kind of general perspective on the topic. We're now going to be looking at two case studies, two architecture projects that relate to building resilience into communities. So how can communities become resilient? Um, the first of these will be uh, Jatin's project, the Sharon Am Centre for Rural Development, uh, which you see here on the screen. Um, we, we've chosen to bring these two small scale projects together because later on we'll be having a an example a case study of a larger community project so we want to uh, showcase the uh, differences and also similarities between the two uh, and show that resilience really uh, is relevant to any type of community no matter its size or location so i'll just introduce uh, jatine um, who will be telling us about sharon am uh, Jatin is an architect. He's based in Manchester and Pondicherry in southern India. He studied at Cambridge, Harvard, MIT and the Architectural Association. Jatin is committed to creating beautiful and inspiring buildings with local communities, often in challenging international contexts and with limited resources. His work is guided by a belief that good, thoughtful design and ethical construction practices can be affordable, transformative, and a force for social and environmental change. He set up his practice in the aftermath of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, working from the ground up with a hands-on holistic approach, integrating bespoke architecture, environmental design, and the delivery of buildings in a socially empowering manner. So I know we're all really looking forward to learning a bit more about the role architects have to play in building up these layers of resilience and dignity into communities. So I'll hand over to you, Jatine, and thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Flora. Thank you, Ulrich. And I, hello, everyone. I do apologize for my lack of technological resilience. Um, I hope you can see the screen. I hope you can hear me. Um, <clears throat> I've got quite a lot to go through, so I'm just going to jump right in. Um, so I'm going to be presenting a long term community project which I designed and built in South India. It's called the Sharanam Centre for Rural Development, and it's for the local nonprofit Saravam. Uh, they wanted a building, but my aim was to start building further resilience into local communities through architecture in a very vulnerable and marginal context. So that really is how design, construction and practice, in other words, the role of the architect, responded to forces, pressures and threats on the ground to improve conditions and to deliver a stimulating community building in the process. So just quick geography where we are, we're in just outside the city, coastal city of Pondicherry in South India. This used to be old French India, but culturally it's very much part of Tamil Nadu. And a quick glimpse, this region can really only be described as a sensory blast. It's lush tropical landscapes, classical temple cities, which are more vibrant today as ever, and possibly the most colorful, comical and make-believe politics in the country, which is all powered by Photoshop. Now, our client, Saravam, they were uplifting poor rural communities and they transformed two entire villages, that's about 7,000 people, through health, education and poverty alleviation programs. It was very pioneering and very, very successful. And in 2007, they commissioned me to design a new centre that would help them expand their reach from two villages to 30, 40 villages. So we began with a hut a thatch hut. And this is what we created, a purpose-built five-acre campus called Sharanam, from where our client can host more village communities and maximize their impact. The campus comprises a large multi-purpose hall, lots of meeting spaces, lots of office buildings, community facilities with lots of sustainable infrastructure. It's a five-acre campus and there's a lot of stuff there. 
It's built entirely from the earth of the site using basic tools entirely by local people. Deliberately, there was no contractor. We built this ourselves. It's low carbon in terms of embodied carbon, CO2 emissions, and it uses very minimal cement and steel despite its scale. The design is contemporary, but is very much rooted in the soil of the land, Tamil culture and local responses to the hot and humid climate. I, I actually love the clever simplicity of Tamil architecture. If you, if you strip back all the ornamentation, it's basically a large roof and a raised floor, whether it's classical temples, poor village houses, or traditional mansions. And this very much informed the initial design concept. But this project is more than designing a sustainable, culturally appropriate building. In order to create the right building, there was a need to understand the local communities and the conditions and the threats that they faced. At the same time, designing the right process was equally important. So let's just go to the ground. What, what are these conditions? <clears throat> of course, there's the climate emergency, and this place is on the front line. A, a local poet described the traditional seasons here as hot, hotter, and hottest. So climate stress is nothing new. But now temperatures are unbearably high, and monsoon rains cause widespread flooding. There's also an acute water crisis. So this place will become unlivable unless things change. Increasingly frequent and violent natural disasters, cyclones, tsunamis, earth tremors. Indeed, this project and our client, their roots are actually in the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, which killed thousands in this region. We, we have no idea how many thousands, but it was a devastating uh, disaster. Local communities, if we go onto the ground, if you look at local people, they were not just impoverished, but they were marginal, chronically underdeveloped. And experts considered them bottom of the scale in every development metric you can think of. The, the, the places just look completely smashed up. The highest level of alcohol addiction in the country this is not having a drink on a Friday night or weekend. This is really severe alcoholism. And men of all ages would be inebriated, totally passed out. There was a total inertia, I mean, a total absence of any energy, uh, any aspiration. It's what Sarvam called a deep and heavy inertia. Violence, domestic abuse, broken families were endemic. Now I'm just touching on the, the social and economic conditions of effectively the people who will use this building. These are our users. There were no jobs other than bits of mindless labor for a week or two. Very few people had employable skills or any experience. For example, until recently, every pitched roof in this part of India was in half round clay tiles, which climatically and aesthetically are perfect. But we found only one man who last made them eight years previously. So generational skills were not just declining, they were lost. And we know why this is happening everywhere. <clears throat> and this is a modern building, believe it or not, and it's finished in use. And so this leads to another question. What about materiality and the process of building? So like many parts of the world, it's very difficult to build a well thought through quality building over in a place like India, even in the big cities, because it's all standardized concrete frames, all construction, lights, construction sites tend to look the same, whether it's a college like what you have on the screen, a hotel, a block of flats, only the scale and the finishes seem to differ. This is poor quality, low skill, high carbon construction, and it's heavily dependent on cement. And plenty of it. India is the second biggest cement maker and the second highest emitter of CO2 after China, and this will just increase. 
So clearly there is a need for low carbon construction and decarbonisation as there is everywhere. There's also an openly visible human cost. All of this, practically all of this construction is dependent on the exploitation of cheap migrant labor. So in South India, it's all North Indian workers and vice versa. So workers cannot run away from runaway home as every contractor and developer will openly tell you. And they are expected to live in squalor on the construction site, working all hours of the day. There is an open exploitation of land, resources, people, women, children, the elderly, bonded labor, even slavery across the supply chain. This is quite a touchy subject, but I'm gonna raise it anyway. And this brings us back to our project. This is a composite image of the landscape right across the road from our site where fertile village farmland has been seized and destroyed by hundreds of acres of illegal quarrying. And to make things worse, the city authorities dump and burn municipal waste here. This is, this is about six to 700 acres of village land. Ecologically, this is beyond dead. This is apocalyptic. And all of this had spread to our site. So that's our context for a building. <clears throat> My question is, in this context, what does resilience mean? We've got multiple emergencies. We've got climate emergency, environmental, social and economic. Why not add a construction emergency? You see how conventional practices make things worse. And these are not just third world conditions. These are local manifestations of global challenges. There is an equivalence in every country. So one of the things that I'd like to discuss later on is what does, in a context like this, what does resilience need to mean to be meaningful for local communities? Here, it's more than climate change. It's got to be people oriented and it has to extend to the way buildings are made. There really is no point designing a zero carbon building if it involves exploitation somewhere else. The process of making a building has also got to be designed. It's got to be designed to build local resilience. So Sharanam had to be more than a building. Local people had to be given a voice and these forces and these threats had to be addressed through the making of our building. And that I do feel is as architects, that is our responsibility. Another question. How does this local definition of resilience define the role of the architect? Now over here, a much broader hands-on role was needed, making the building as well as designing it. It basically had to be created out of nothing by doing all of these different roles you see on the screen. There's no project team. This is the role of the architect. So in this context, how, how can we promote resilience through design? So the first move was to heal and revive the damaged landscape, transform this wasteland, bring it back to life. And over 1600 trees were planted and a traditional drip irrigation system was revived with local people. And this immediately starts the restoration of biodiversity. But today the site is not dead, it's alive. And there's a long, from the road, there's a long meandering path through new plantation groves and gardens leading to the building entrance, which are designed around these revived palmyra trees, new planting, new gardens, and these new ponds, which also help flood, drain flood water. There's a large community amphitheater cut into the natural slope of the site. And I do feel reviving a landscape is an integral experience of creating a community space. Then designing resilience through a respect for local culture and sensitivities, even if, even if we as architects don't necessarily agree with what inputs we're given. So during the design, community inputs were encouraged in very targeted ways. For example, to us, this cement sheet roof is highly inappropriate, but consider the owner's perspective. 
consider the perspective from the community. This simple example conveys a deep aspiration from the traditional to something more contemporary. And in this situation, designing a heritage building could potentially have been disastrous. So a contemporary building, but still rooted in Tamil culture. So the main building comprises an open superstructure with small closed earthbound structures arranged underneath, creating lots of flexible spaces. This, this language, this massing, this is the same, you find, this is the language of traditional Tamil temples. The primary materials are earth and local black granite, and these slabs of stone step down towards the main hall, again, very much like a Tamil temple. And the change in materials and levels creates a threshold between inner and outer clean and unclean spaces right across the building. It's actually where people remove their footwear. It's the, it's the start of the interior. It defines the interior of the building. Now, one of the essential design thoughts was, what deeper qualities does this building need to convey? And I kept coming back to this word dignity, which is so important when we're dealing with vulnerable communities. There was a need for scale, power, even you know, to create a tangible sense of a tangible feeling and a kind of an atmosphere, but also a sense of openness, lightness, inclusiveness, shelter and refuge, which incidentally is what Sharana means. It means shelter and refuge. So the main hall is a very simple multi-use space. It's scaled and detailed for conversations, community meetings, workshops, and performances. And it's defined by a massive granite thinai, which is a raised platform from traditional Tamil homes, again, creating a sense of cultural familiarity and comfort. And again, the open pillars evoke the traditional Tamil temple, but they also funnel in coastal breezes. Um, creating thermal comfort is an important aspect of designing resilience. As is creating a sense of well-being and tranquility. Don't design something cheap and functional, but create something really special for the most impoverished. So the building is integrated with nature, the natural light is very soft, there's no glare. Natural acoustics that carry the sound of flowing water through the structure, and the spaces just step down and merge into the landscape. So totally open to nature. And it's deliberately a very playful building with lots of imaginative spaces, which are revealed as you move through it, or you peek around the corner. And to create a balance, there are a lot of smaller verandas, courtyards and offices for privacy. Privacy, again, a luxury in Indian villages. These smaller buildings are very cool. They're very transparent on the inside, but externally they appear solid and the blank walls really come to life with shadows throughout the day. Now, very often as architects, you have to critique cultural practices and it's very touchy, very sensitive, but it's necessary to promote resilience and improve conditions. So for example, we had co-design sessions for the kitchen and toilets, which are traditionally treated as dark, dingy, dirty back of house areas. You do not design kitchens and toilets, but here they were and they were designed through the cycle of respect as spacious buildings flooded with natural light and fresh air with the same quality of detailing and very good plumbing. And to this day, both are treated respectfully and remain spotlessly clean. So the buildings are quite simple. The spaces are not prescriptive in any way. And I've always thought of community buildings as a framework of flexible multi-use spaces of different scales. It just makes the design more resilient. It's suitable for changing needs. And Sharanam really is conceived as a setting in the landscape. It, it really looks like it's always been there, a, a kind of a background which comes to life when people with colorful clothing move through it. 
Now, <clears throat> that's design. Even better than involving local people in design is involving them in constructing their buildings. And in response to the lost livelihoods, the poverty, the unemployment, the lack of skills, the whole of Sharanam from top to bottom, from beginning to end, was built by employing and training local people on the job. There's no contractors. The aim was to really create an ethical and socially empowering construction site. And what this allowed was it allowed us to use the construction funds, not to use it for profit, nothing was lost through corruption, but to invest that funding to make the building, but also invest it into local people, promoting long-term livelihoods and resilience through new skills, teaching them new skills. So we had a number of rules to encourage local people to participate in this construction, no experience necessary. Working hours were nine to five, after which everybody goes home. Nobody lives on the building site. No volunteering, but full pay. This was not a photo opportunity. And the golden rule was anyone entering the construction site gates had to learn at least one new skill. So we have local people and also the most local of materials. The buildings are all built from the red soil of, the, of our own site, not someone else's land. We have not made a hole in somebody else's land. And in the process, we got a rainwater reservoir for irrigation. Um, so two things in one. I mean, sometimes the answer is right in front of you, you know, to make a building from your own soil. And using that soil, we, we manufactured over 200,000 compressed earth blocks of different sizes using only 5% cement, really precise bricks. And over 40 unemployed young men and women were guided step by step in the whole sequence of work. It's labor intensive, guarantees employment and income, and the work was done with great care and precision. And afterwards, after the project, a group of these guys set up their own manufacturing plant. Now, compared to normal bricks, these are more precise, they're stronger, cheaper, and they're non-polluting because they're not fired, but they gain strength by being wet cured under the hot sun. So there's no trashing of the environment and local people earn a, earned a proper living by learning a new clean skill together. And all the building fabric you see in this section is made from earth, apart from some sort of main principal beams which are in reinforced concrete. And apart from the rainwater pipes, everything is made by hand on the construction site. By local people. So rammed earth foundations, where possible, it's such a sustainable alternative to concrete. Over half the workers had no skills, limited literacy. literacy. They couldn't even write their names, half of them. So Ilango here was initially employed as the site security guard. And he learned block making, rammed earth, simple masonry. He did all the planting and irrigation. And he can also fabricate a reinforcement cage by hand on a simple jig, as they do in this part of the world. Precision engineering with basic tools, such as using a simple water pipe to create a three millimeter camber in the steel ties. So when the vault is built and it pushes out on the springer beams, the tie rods straighten in tension to counter the lateral thrust. No engineers, just hands-on architecture, local people and a water pipe. And this is Money Kundan who from scratch very quickly became multi-skilled in every trade you can imagine. And he became my right-hand man on site. And today he is in charge of the maintenance team at the Sharanam campus and he explains the building to visitors. Now there are lots of local masons, but there's an argument that infilling concrete frames has by eyeball has de-skilled an entire generation. They just about knew how to use a trowel. That was about it. 
but through close supervision, demonstrations, and simple coded drawings, they learned the science of masonry, proper masonry. All these dimensions are spot on, better than in the UK. Reviving traditional plastering and experimenting with waste materials and soil to create new types of finishes. Now, an important incentive in learning new skills was the payment system. So yes, as an architect, I did pay the workers as well. And the unique thing was workers set their own rates of pay. There was nothing outlandish. It was just normal commercial rates. I do not recall ever needing to negotiate a single wage or a contract sum. So every Saturday, distributing wages was actually a very joyous end to the week, a very positive ritual. The workers would clean their tools, change clothes, and each individual signed their name on the same chart and received their full pay in hand. There was no middlemen, no deductions, no brokers, no bosses skimming off percentages. As the workers themselves said, no cheating. It was totally transparent and everyone saw what everybody else was earning. And actually, um, many workers learned to write their names for the first time on this, on this chart, this spreadsheet. Now, in the context I described, receiving your due wage was visibly empowering. It created a sense of self-confidence. Many workers started photographing their week's work on their phones. And as an architect, I, I have no hesitation in saying that that simple spreadsheet was the most important piece of design on this project, that spreadsheet, because it built up trust between the workers and myself as the architect. And building up trust is so critical when you work directly with communities. So it's a very different site culture to what we normally find on a construction site. Now, the thing is, with trust, you can take certain risks. You can be innovative. You can push boundaries. You can experiment. For example, building large vaults with no formwork. In other words, these vaults are self-supporting. They're pretty big. They span nine and a half meters, and they're only nine centimeters thick at the center. Um, and the profile is optimized to build the strongest possible structure with the least amount of material. This increases resource efficiency. It's, it's another level of sustainable design. Again, it's local semi-skilled masons who only knew how to use a trowel trained in precision engineering on the job and getting paid for it. This has to be millimeter perfect and otherwise the technique fails and it uses nothing more complicated than two forms and string. This was done as a four month contract, but they finished it in eight weeks and got a very, very healthy bonus for their efforts. Now, my general approach to working directly with local people is I know something, they know something. It's, it works both ways. And particularly with the six or seven workers who had a real latent skill and it becomes very collaborative. I get a real schooling in design and detailing and their, their quality and workmanship is taken to another level. So for example, Mustafa, <clears throat> the young stonemason, he was laying stone flooring in apartments in his sleep, but he'd learned three dimensional stone installation on a huge scale. And he used to photograph his work at the end of every day. There's, there's no grout, it's what we call paper joints. It's, uh, it's just perfect. Polony had an experience of precasting, and these thin cement channels formed an alternative roofing system. And we trained lots of masons in precasting, uh, making perfectly fitting components for rapid assembly. Ilango, the carpenter, experienced in making beds and cabinets primarily as wedding gifts. And he'd never attempted work on this scale, but he was guided step by step for every door and window. There's, there's no warping, everything slides open so smoothly. It's, re it's really beautifully done. In fact, all the finishes to this building 
something which is really quite difficult to do in India, you know, to create a, a nicely finished building. All the finishes, all the workmanship was outstanding. It was immaculate. And there's lots and lots of other examples. And it's a zero waste site. The large sanitation building was built from leftover materials. And even the pebbles sieved out of the earth at the very beginning were laid as a flooring finish at the end. So no waste. That's one of many daily hazards on the Sharonam site. Now, <clears throat> before I kind of wrap up and evaluate the impact of this building, I, I do want to say this, this project did face lots of ridiculous delays and challenges. Some were entirely expected given turbulent weather and local politics, but there was one really sort of unexpected observation, and that was the stark contrast between the capabilities work ethic, knowledge, and progress of local workers, and the total opposite of most local professionals. The whole project was completely beyond most of them, but they, so, they somehow sort of clung on, they just hung on. So these are the design, construction, and practice strategies promoting local resilience. What's the impact? Well, I'll just give you a few examples of this. This building using the community did take longer. It's experimental and there was no project team, but look at the cost. Sharanam was half the cost of prime real estate construction in Pondicherry. Half the cost of that concrete building. So it disproves the usual excuse for poor buildings, which is that good design costs money. And I think one day all the social, economic and environmental value will also be monetized. Over 300, a total of over 300 local people were directly employed and almost all were upskilled. And 50% of the construction funds were directly invested into communities through wages. And this investment set them up with new skills to improve long-term livelihoods. And since the project, their trajectories have changed in so many ways. Previously, unskilled workers are working as masons, as employable tradesmen. Many have gone to college. Masons have now become proper masons, even contractors. And the skilled workers are taking lucrative professional contracts in the big cities. But this is more important. Many of them now have the confidence to design and build small sustainable community projects themselves using Sharanam as a reference. So there's a whole series of community radio stations. In the top left, a biological waste treatment plant for a nearby, camp, uh, nearby campus being built by a whole team of masons. And remember Mani Kandan at the bottom left? Well, he's designed and built his own two-tiered rainwater sump and filtration unit. All of this increasing community resilience organically, but now from within. 14 workers now form the entire maintenance and management team at Sharanam. They run this campus today. This includes a lot of the key main workers, including the head masons. Having built this place, they have developed a deep bond, a sense of ownership, pride and belonging. What's more, they have the technical knowledge. So it's a really sustainable way of handing over a project, but it also keeps the values and ethos of the project alive. The use of the building. Well, this is the client's responsibility now. As architects, we do have to let go. The original objective to expand Sarvam's scope and reach, well, from this new facility, they've expanded their reach from two villages to over 40. So they've gone from 7,000 people to 150,000 people. And this change, the, the sort of, the data that's been collected on the ground shows visible improvements in health, education, and the empowerment of women, really making communities stronger. Um, but that change is slow, it's, it's incremental, it, it's really generational. But it does have to be said, without proper dedicated usage, this building 
will not necessarily make any, social, any sort of difference in terms of resilience. And good architecture can generate financial resilience for clients. This entire building, its process, its narrative has raised the client's profile enormously and it's been very transformative with lots of international recognition and new long-term funding, which has increased their activities and even expanded their campus in, in their own way. Another not entirely unexpected impact, but very important in a place like India, the quality of the building is designed as a framework has broadened the use. It's not just village communities, but teacher training colleges, special needs schools, colleges, um, government agencies, even corporate companies come to this place and have programs there. They share the space. It's even become an appropriate venue for mindfulness and well-being workshops run by corporate firms. So what was a dead wasteland is now alive. And these varied uses do help reduce spatial inequalities, which is quite rare in the segregation and hierarchies of a place like India. So all of this suggests the building has transcended expectations. But it is important to say that all those conditions I mentioned at the start, they still exist, but they have been addressed through architecture. And I feel that if we've made even a 1% difference, it's been worthwhile. And it is now really down to the way the building um, is used to build on what an architectural project has set up. I just want to end with a, a brief point about something which, I, which is very close to me. Um, what about the resilience of the architectural profession? And working directly with communities on, and issues on the ground, such as here, can actually make our own profession more resilient, more relevant as we move forward. And the reason I offer this very optimistic outlook is midway through the project, I was joined for several months by nine graduate architects who immersed themselves in this way of hands-on working with the community, the issues, the design, the construction, the practice, learning new skills together. And it was completely seamless for them and younger architects have an incredible appetite for wanting to take on these issues. Working from the ground up is just one way. And this is incredibly hopeful and promising for the future role of architects, but also for communities and environments left behind by conventional practice. So all over the world, projects like Sharanam show the far wider potential of the architect's role and the role of architecture. It is possible to take on local issues and improve communities through the making of, the, of a building. It really can be done and architecture can take the lead. So <clears throat> I think I'll stop there. Thank you for putting up with uh, a slightly uh, messed up vi visual presentation, but I think I'll hand back to Flora and Ulrich in, uh, in Venice. Many thanks, Chetin. This was a very, very good example of a concrete project, how it can really function. Due to time, uh, we want to present Sam Orsin's uh, project in comparison with the Sharanam project. And after that, we will go into the discussion of both these projects. But uh, this uh, of uh, Chatin is really remarkable, and uh, now we let let's see at Sam Olsen and uh, make our discussion afterwards. Yeah, look forward to it. Yeah, thank you so much, Chatin. I completely echo that. I think it was brilliant, and there's so much positivity in there that we can discuss. Um, so I'll just uh, introduce our next speaker, Sam Olsen, who I believe is online. Um, and uh, yeah, so Sam is an architect. Um, he's a principal in Atkin Olsen Shade Architects in Philadelphia, uh, a firm that specializes in a wide variety of institutional projects, including university, museum, school, hospitality, and religious commissions. He received a BA and Masters of Architecture degrees from the University of Pennsylvania. And he has since served as an architectural critic of multiple architecture schools. He currently serves on the board of Mural Arts Philadelphia, 
uh, which is a local arts and community organization. And today he'll be telling us about his own case study, a project in New Mexico. So thank you, Sam, I'll hand over to you. Uh, Great. Everyone can see uh, see my screen? Yeah, Great. we can hear you. Uh, Thanks. Great. Jatina, I think that was uh, wonderful. You really set a fine example of uh, wonderful, resilient architecture and uh, probably one part of our discussion should be uh, the influence of Balkrishna Doshi. I studied in India and I can definitely see his influence there and I really applaud the, the wonderful efforts uh, that you made in setting the kind of groundwork for uh, local people uh, being given a voice and, and dignity. So I want to really kind of pick up on those themes that uh, Jatina mentioned and talk about this case study for a project in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, those of you who are not as familiar, New Mexico is part of the United States. It's north of the country of Mexico. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, opportunity to work on a great project here. And so some of the things that I want to focus on, we have an office of 20 people in Philadelphia, six people in uh, New Mexico. Uh, we do a lot of work in that area with uh, local peoples, uh, colleges and universities, et cetera. But I think our common themes are what is the essence of community, really thinking about this, and the notion about how affordability and climate-centered sustainability can be leveraged in creating resilient communities, again, uh, the way uh, Jadine was just talking about. And of course, because a lot of these projects are relatively new, we're really talking about innovative ways of thinking about housing and uh, the ways uh, thinking about innovative technologies. We still haven't quite figured out how to, how to evaluate the project success, all these projects. So I think that'll be something that we can talk about as a group. And then uh, the ideas of community building is promoting cultural, social, and economic resilience. It's really all these themes in, in the local context. And the notion that local people being given a voice, uh, this is a, a charrette where um, various people of various ages, uh, even uh, young people were given little blocks so that the notion of thinking about how do you build a community could be thought about on a micro level and a three-dimensional level. So the project it itself was to build 80,000 square feet of affordable housing on five acres of land, 65 rental units. Uh, this upper uh, uh, square here is, is the state of New Mexico in the United States. The, the country of New Mexico is right below here. This is New Mexico blown up in this particular area, Santa Fe. This is the downtown area, which is relatively wealthy, and we're in the Southwest, which is the style oh. yard site. Sorry, Sam, just to a... interrupt, sorry. Um, we can't see your PowerPoint. We can see your uh, desktop that shows, I don't think you've quite clicked it open. The Venice, it says Venice 2021, but we can't see the presentation. You can't see the presentation. No. You've shared your desktop, I think, maybe instead of the PowerPoint. Uh, it says you were screen sharing. Right, hang on a second. Let's try again. How about now? Yes. Brilliant. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Then let me go back. A, let me go back a slide then. Well, let me, let me, if we're on this one, this, this shows um, the downtown Santa Fe area. And this, the demographic here shows that the average age is 33 uh, in the area we're looking at. Um, the, the vast percentage of the demographic is Latino. And the average uh, median home value is only 162,000, which is not much money in, for the United States. You can see the downtown area is much wealthier in this area. So we're really dealing with a young, predominantly Latino and predominantly less uh, economically um, uh, fortunate uh, community. So the essence of community is really what we wanted to kind of focus on. Many people think that there's really tri-cultures in Santa Fe, which is the indigenous, meaning the Native American, the Anglo, meaning uh, white, um, English, Spanish immigrants, and the Latino community. But it is because the um, United States is really a destination for integration and immigration. There's a, a, a real hybridization of both black and Asian, uh, multiple different tribal communities. There's 400 different 400 tribal communities. Tribal communities. So, so, so the essence. 
Yes, that's a vision that is really uh, downtown plaza. Um, many people can no longer afford to live in the downtown area. They've been marginalized and moved to the uh, to the outside. It, gentrification, this is a destination for people with second homes in the Santa Fe area, so that many people in the Hispano community, which is Latino, Hispanic, and Native American, have been forced to the margins. And then um, the creative arts community, which is really the maker spaces. This is a project about uh, making not just uh, artwork, but baking, uh, car uh, manufacturing, fabrication, and how these people who are interested in fabrication can really create a home for themselves. It's the geographic center of the city. It was an old um, manufacturing and wastewater treatment plant, as I mentioned, and it's a notion, how do you reclaim the space to make it, make it something special? So the upper left and the lower left shows what most people think about what Santa Fe is like. And I, I think what we talk about this is kind of cultural appropriation. This is the classic adobe where mud is um, put over top of bricks, much the way Jatin talked about it in, in India. And so much so has this culture been appropriated that Santa Fe, New Mexico has standards that all new construction generally in, in, in most neighborhoods need to be done in this adobe style. And as a result, you have this uh, homogenization of architecture where everything is this brown or off tan look. And it's really mimicking this building, the governor's palace on the lower left, which is 400 years old. So our site on the right-hand side is much more about contemporary materials and not cultural appropriation. This was an old warehouse site there's a lot of use of corrugated metal, rib metal, uh, wire mesh, uh, steel trusses, et cetera. And we were more interested in thinking about resilient communities that aren't trying to do cultural appropriation, but much more about what are the most readily available materials that are made out of recycled materials that are cost effective and think about how do you create a neighborhood um, like that. So as Jatina talked about, none of these things happen overnight. Uh, we're talking about nine years so far in this project where Creative Santa Fe and Artscape began research on a creative live work community. It wasn't until uh, a not-for-profit, the Interfaith Housing uh, Organization, uh, won the commission to uh, take over this site, this five-acre site. Uh, the City of Santa Fe donated the five acres, which really helped the project um, gain some traction. Uh, we were awarded the commission to be the architect uh, there were some federal low-income housing tax credits, which really helped uh, move the project along. And construction began last year, of course, right in the, in the midst of COVID, which added to the um, dynamics uh, uh, and, and troubles in order to kind of move the project forward. But I'm going to show you where we are right now, because we are scheduled to actually have some families move in Thanksgiving in the United States. And then uh, later, by Christmas time, uh, the project will be uh, fully occupied. So I think, again, local people having to be given a voice, everything really kind of begins with the notion of a, of a charrette and thinking, as I mentioned, about young people and older people, people that uh, make a flat rate that are considered um, uh, marginal with regards to economic means, really had a chance to compete to get an opportunity for a house here. So the notion about community collaboration, looking at the site from the beginning, because there was nothing on the site at all, it had been cleared. And then 30 local artists really sat down to help us figure out well, how do we manage water? How do we manage uh, solar orientation? How do we manage site access? And then also, again, thinking about what Jatina said, the notion of separating privacy from community. What is your space? What is shared space? And if you're an artist, how do you make space and get your space to make space? But uh, oftentimes when you're an artist, you really want to think about being stimulated by others around you. This is the site. You can really see how it's the Brownfield site in a much more uh, economically distressed uh, warehouse district. And really kind of sitting down again with these kind of building blocks and think about how do you put a building together? How do you stitch together the notion of uh, urban infrastructure and create a site that is, that is meaningful? Santa Fe is not a very walkable uh, city. So uh, there's, there's cars, there's car share, et cetera. Um, and of course, materials need to be delivered. So really kind of thinking about a platform for creative workforce, development of local arts community, 
thinking when you start thinking about affordable housing, you need to think about modular. And one thing we're blessed with in the United States is is wood and wood frame construction. And because wood is both low carbon, it regenerates. Uh, and when trees are taken down, new trees are planted. So again, you know, the notion of trying to steer clear of as much concrete as we can and, and use wood frame construction wherever wherever possible and create a community that does not feel the pressure of gentrification. This is for a community unto itself where people can feel comfortable that they're not going to be pushed out. And the uh, notion of uh, offsetting uh, carbon, uh, carbon related issues, how do we collect water? So north is directly up, which means that ultimately this site seems best to orient north-south so we can maximize solar uh, orientation, create some open spaces here uh for um both passive and active recreation just looking at this as a phase two as community building where these are all uh, private spaces this is a site analysis that we did kind of looking at how does water flow across the strait how do we collect it there are amazing views here of, of the sandia mountains the emez mountains um, etc the easements that this allows us to think about a community building uh in the future I mentioned the solar orientation, the, the sun uh, sets to the east, uh, rises in the east and sets in the west. We can maximize solar orientation this way. Thinking about minimizing car impact and maximizing the pedestrian impact was very important here. Uh, minimizing the, the sizes of the buildings so we have pedestrian thoroughfares between each of the spaces. Optimizing spaces for recreation for both young people and a playground here and basketball as well. And then the artistic community, it's not just that you are insular and working within your space to create artwork, but to create artwork that can be seen by the public, both at the micro scale, you and your community, and by passersby that drive down the major streets to help uh, promote uh, and give the building uh, presence and uh, an iconic vision. And then the opportunity for selling your wares, jewelry, uh, ceramics, et cetera, on market days through the building, through the building uh, forms here. So it's really thinking collectively and collaboratively with all the 30 different people who participate in this, how to make this the strongest community um, that it could be. The way to do that really is kind of doing a modular aspect. Uh, this shows kind of a bed, hall, bath, and then the kind of live, work, studio, and the kitchen. Uh, with, with a door, uh, and then if you take this module that divides into kind of dwelling, community, and production, and then you create a series of interlocking forms, you really get these kind of um, buildings that uh, foster interaction and create privacy at the same time with stairways uh, on either end. So this is some of the diagrams that we did, both as our own internal studies and also to share with the communities, we developed the, the drawings. Um, uh, much as uh, Jatin talked about, uh, New Mexico can be extremely hot. Uh, it can also be uh, um, cold in the winter times, but during the hot months, uh, creating a, a um, brief soleil, a, a kind of pergola across here that creates shade, and then solar panels facing here on the south uh, face take advantage of the solar orientation. And the double height and single height spaces create some variety. This shows that the proposed artwork on the ends of every one of the units. So this is the, the kind of final rendering that we showed to the various funding sources, showed to the client, showed to the community. Uh, this is the phase two, the community building here. But you can see the effort taken to uh, both add plantings, create the basketball and the playground spaces, that every, even though it's a, a modular approach where the buildings are repeated, each one has its own unique character uh, with the artwork, with the solar, uh, with the porch in the front, uh, and then the surrounding uh, spaces around it. This is, again, some of the final renderings that shows the, how the buildings are going to be painted color, the um, solar uh, shelves here to both uh, create light shelves to bring light inside and create some uh, protection for the south-facing windows. Uh, introduction of many more trees here. Again, it was a sewage treatment facility. This is a complete transformation of site. And this is that thoroughfare down here on the bottom where it can be set up in uh, on market days for the artists to sell their wares and exchange ideas. These are some photos that uh, were taken uh, in July. These ones on the left, again, using uh, wood frame construction, the, the deep porches. Uh, later, the weather barriers have been added to the buildings. Unlike Jatins, this was not 
built by the community, but the community was really involved in the design. This is a local uh, construction company that employed local um, local and indigenous people, but not people who actually lived in the building. These were taken in a, uh, earlier this month in October that show um, the, the building forms, uh, the shelves, the, the windows that have gone in, and then the beginnings of these kind of public spaces uh, in between. So we're getting close to um, fin finishing the construction, uh, really shows how the forms are really coming together. And so now we're getting to the point, I think this is really the kind of last slide about what, you know, th what the artists have been up to. They've been thinking and been hoping this project was gonna come to pass for some time. Uh, many of them uh, are involved in both abstract art and some are in more literal, literal and especially into narrative art that will allow them to start thinking about uh, using materials and working on a, on a major scale, on a mural scale. Here you can see um, corn, uh, Native Americans, the kind of tribal uh, dress, et cetera, that are influencing some of the ideas here uh, about what these murals are going to inform to decorate these, the outsides of the building. So this is, a, this is really kind of the last slide and I'll kind of turn it uh, back over to, to Flora and Ulrich to think about these are the kind of questions that both Jatine and, and, and our firm have kind of generated thinking about shared values, the essence of community, uh, affordable housing, what kinds of materials do you choose, how do you get people who live there and who are um, uh, vested in the communities to think about making it something they can feel proud of. I think again the notion of dignity making not not forcing people to live in a community that they don't want to but making sure they have a voice in the beginning so they really feel proud of it and can continue to make it evolve for them and then i think we we all want to talk about this kind of benchmark of success what is this going what are these what these facilities going to look like in five years 10 years 20 years and have we taught people new skills to allow them to duplicate these ideas uh, as they move forward and um, promoting the cultural and social and economic resilience here, because I think this is really a, not just about climate resilience, but about cultural and social resilience to make sure that we're creating something that doesn't use more resources than we have and can be something that we can all be proud of. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I propose that we uh, can leave your questions on the screen, no? that we have present the questions. Can I open um, up to questions from the audience? So if there's anyone who has any immediate questions about either of the projects, um, you know, please do either unmute yourself and ask, or you can type into the chat, that would be, that'd be great. In the meantime, perhaps uh, we can we can just uh, dive into the discussion. Uh, yeah, here we have it. Very good. Uh, um, when uh, looking at the first two questions of Jetin as well as of Sam, I think the important common point is uh, formulated by Sam. How can shared values define the essence of a community? For me, it was uh, very, very convincing in this respect, the approach of Jatin to involve the local community from the very beginning. And I think also for other projects uh, and discussions about resilience, this shared value point is essential. Also uh, to make a linkage to the presentations we had in the morning, uh, to the point uh, of uh, Alessandro Scafi about how to generate a community, a real community of human beings at all. And I think here are shared values essential. And as Chetin has shown, they can be really built up, they can be generated through a certain directed activity in involving people. What do you think about this shared value aspect? Is that, um, should we talk about that to, together, really? I, I think, uh, Jatin, really the notion of many people coming together to have, um, knowing that they can change their community and really kind of make a difference. I think that is something that I think both of these projects really kind of address in, in many ways. These are people that really wanted to be there and really cared passionately about what they were doing. Yes, I think I think that um, <clears throat> the collective act of 
learning and building together and especially building your own space or a space that has been that that will be created for you for your community that is so rewarding and transformative just to be involved i mean when you have communities who are from a lower socioeconomic background um in sam's case who are totally marginalized downtrodden for generations as in what i had to deal with just to involve people that's that's respect you know that that is that's the that's the basis of even thinking of shared values respecting local people um and i think that is that is such an ethical and such a virtuous thing just to try and do through architecture and the 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 economics of building uh, particularly commercial building do not don't allow you a space to do that. I think a lot of architects would love to do this um, and particularly to build affordable housing in the United States, what Sam is doing. That's no joke, absolutely no joke. Um, so I take my hat off to you. I think it's wonderful. And, but, it, but it begins with respect, respecting local people. One of the projects that we that we didn't show is uh, uh, OK Winye, which is a, a, a tribal community expansion that we did uh, for Native Americans not far from Santa Fe. And in that case, we actually uh, people there had been living in trailer homes and modular homes, and the whole notion of cultural uh, passing down um, traditional building traditions had, had been completely lost by the young people, and by introducing the notion of creating homes from baked clay very much again in India. And then every year is an annual cultural uh, uh, tradition to put a new smooth coat of mud on the outside is right. both an essence of building and it's an essence of, of making a structure. And so we kind of got involved in that and it's really uh, been a wonderful way to move away from the modular or prefabricated traditions and get into something that's much more about the local culture, which we, we love seeing that kind of thing because Again, I mentioned there's 400 different tribal communities in the United States, and everyone has their own their own culture, and they should not be um, marginalized and put in a, in manufactured housing, which really doesn't make sense from resilient economic ecological uh, sense whatsoever. Yes, absolutely. Oh, you mentioned that the local skills and traditions have been lost. Is there a, is there a particular um, is there a particular reason why they've been lost? Is it just like in India, people want concrete, an, an aspiration for modernity, or is it? Um... No, I think it's a much sadder reason than that, which is, I think, you know, beginning in the 1870s and 1880s, when uh, the Anglos moved further and further west and took over more land and, and made treaties and quotation marks with the Native Americans. Native Americans were really forced to lose their culture. They lost their language. They lost uh, their hair, their dress, and they were forced to go to American schools in many ways to be forced to become Americanized. And as a result, all those kinds of traditions and, and cultures have really been lost in many ways. There's a lot, again, like you showed with uh, issues of, of alcoholism, uh, joblessness, et cetera. And it's yes, really yes. much more recently that there's been a, an understanding and appreciation of those cultures and, and an effort to allow those cultures to really speak for themselves and be something kind of special. Yes, and I think that, that's, a, that's a really good point where you, where you raise about culture speaking for themselves and how it's possible to do that through architecture, through building, through design. I, I was particularly struck by how you involve the community at the very start in design, or not the start, but um, in design, an early stage of design. Is that something you could tell us more about? Because I, I did find that very, very difficult on my project, because when you ask people- We gotta run through and clean anything up before the ownership group shows up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whomever they are. <laughs> and make sure. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Um, is that something yeah, you could tell us more about? Because it was um, very difficult to do that in Sharanam, but and it had to be very targeted for very specific cultural things. Um, but from the photographs you showed, it seemed that like you really had the community round the table and you were really discussing planning and concepts and massing and you know, pure design. Well, I think it, it, 
Right. I think the advantage that we had is that we knew we were doing 65 units. We knew generally what size they were going to be. Mm -hmm. And if you make a little modular block that represents that, that size and shape, it allows people to move the different pieces around almost like little puzzle pieces and put them in a way of either stacking them or aligning them and thinking about solar orientation, uh, et cetera. And really, it, then you can evaluate the pros and cons of those 65 blocks. What do you achieve in certain ways? What do you lose in other ways? I think when you do a project like yours, which was a, a, you know, a larger community building, and I, you know, I love the integration of, of waterways and natural light between them, it's, I mean, yours is in many ways a more sophisticated project that really required you to kind of take more of a lead on those ideas and then help I assume bring the community along about why what you were doing would make sense from a design point of view but then think I mean I really like what you talked about learning from each other which I think is fantastic because even though some of those people are semi-skilled they brought some knowledge uh, that you didn't have and how you put a building together exactly. and you really exchange exactly. ideas. And if you don't have that mutual respect, you're really not going to get anywhere. Yeah, I mean, ideally, it is collaborative with local people. If, if you come in as the um, with a top down approach, um, you may end up with a good building, but it might not be valued or even the right building for the community. I, that's an interesting point you mentioned. I, I often at the start of my talk, I, I said, building further resilience into communities, because I'm sure you found this as well. A lot of marginal, impoverished, uh, downtrodden communities, they have got resilience. In order to just survive and face all, you know, just survive against all the daily threats and pressures that they have to deal with, whether it's poor governance, appalling environment, um, bad housing, whatever it is, these guys already have a ton of resilience, but they're just not allowed to thrive. They're not allowed to flourish in any way. And one of the things I found was training local workers in precision building skills. They picked it up so quickly. There was no need for Masons to go to college for six months or two years, as you have to do in the UK. They learned it in two days. Um, when we were setting out the building, I thought that was the most difficult thing. I turned up from England with lasers on the site. And of course, in that ridiculous hot sun, you cannot see the lasers. But some of the Masons who only knew how to use a trowel, they knew Pythagoras 345 and that we set up precision, absolutely perfect right angles to set out the building. And the amount of things that I learned from them, just practical skills, improved the design and detailing of the building. It just does. How far can you push it? Um, and once once you have the workers buying in, the architect is listening, is incorporating our ideas, you've got total 100% buy-in and you can really start pushing boundaries. So a lot of the detailing on, on the building would have been several notches lower if that collaboration was not there. The quality of the building would have been, um, would have been much lower. Could have been much more rusty. One of, right. One of the things that I, I like about what you had, had done was uh, when I studied with, with Doshi, Doshi studied with Louis Kahn. Louis Kahn taught at University of Pennsylvania, which is where right. I went. I see that okay, okay. Kimball art, art, art Museum in what you did. And one I, of my favorite, I one think, of my favorite buildings. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite, it's, and mine as well. And, and I think what I learned when I was there is that how do you take just as you were saying about the use of laser, how do you take these sophisticated ideas and geometries, bring it to another country and community yeah. and use it in a way and, and distill it to its essence and really figure out the notions of shade and shadow that you were talking about as far as creating places to deal with the climate and use the local materials in order to uh, achieve that as well. And I think that was, that was great to, to see that. I, one slide that you had up just for a very short amount of time, probably what we should talk about is, and actually it's not mentioned here at all, is, is challenges. And I saw you had the word um, sabotage, you had the issues of kind of caste and communities, yeah. um, et cetera, coming through that. Maybe maybe you can kind of talk about some of the, we, we can exchange ideas here about the challenges we face in trying to put these projects together. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be very upfront about it. Um, the client, a concrete building would have been fine here just a bog standard concrete building. The client, for the client, a building was a building. And a lot of the issues which are presented um, 
I never I never shared with the client. So the client is a non-profit organization who runs for whom this building was built. Because one of the things I was really fearful of was bringing up this whole idea of employing local people, whether they, they would immediately equate that as in an economic way, saying, no, no, it will be a waste of money, the construction funds will dry up. Concepts of dignity, never raised it ever in any client meetings. I mean, as far as the client was concerned, it was about, you're going to get a good building with a good story. And that had to, that was calculated. That was really just, te- that was just getting a feel of all the different social stratas in India I was working with, because I don't know about your projects, but in a place like India, you've, if you're going to build something, even a block of flats, the architect or developer has got to be able to communicate to a politician, police, mafia, all the way down to construction workers on the ground. And you've somehow got to get everybody on on side. So you don't tell everyone everything, but I found the greatest level of trust is with the workers. The challenges really were with everything outside the bubble of the workers. There was um, local consultants were really disappointing. I mean, quite, um, I mean, non-performance. I mean, just nothing, very, very little. Um, the government, there, there were the government was responding to environmental problems by basically stopping um, putting an embargo on cement and sand, of which we use very little. But riverbeds were basically being um, just destroyed overnight by trucks and trucks of lorries taking the sand. So they just stopped it. There was no sand. There was no cement because of incredible air pollution. So cement factories were shut down. So there was problems in the material supply chain. The area was also very violent. Violence is an incredible part of Tamil culture. If you look at Tamil films and billboards, there's swords and blood. It is just horrific. Um, I'm not used to that stuff, you know. Um, But violence in local villages, between local villages. So this is an area where there are 200 villages and each village is its own universe. Sharanam was the only building site where these village guys were actually coming together to work, breaking down these barriers, and there was no problem. But violence between one village and another spread to the construction site and actually brought the the project to a standstill for almost a year. And there's very little you can do about it unless you, again, speak to local people. And what happened was basically a worker on the building site, um, I did show a photograph of him, he had a real desire for perfection. He wanted to make his pre-casting unit so perfectly, so beautifully spot on, he could not tolerate another mason working in a really slightly shoddy way. And this was the thing. When we talk about training, what level of training, what level of standards do you want to achieve? And a lot of the workers wanted perfection. They saw what was possible, but some didn't care. And unfortunately, that spilled over into violence off out of the building site, and it comes back onto the building site. And he was, the mason in question, a hit squad was sent to kill him on the building site. Wow. Uh, To murder the mason on the building site, at a time when everybody knew I was on a plane back to the UK for two weeks. Now, what happens when local violence spills onto a building site? It has to go to the client who doesn't, who believes in all these sort of boundaries and social boundaries and we don't talk to village people, blah, blah, blah. When I came back from England, a mob of workers was gathering at the gates And I was actually quite nervous about what was going to happen. The construction site has been stopped for a long time. There's been violence. People have lost their jobs. Um, And what happened was they just just wanted to talk. And they came to the construction site gate and they said, we are sorry. That's all they wanted. But in the hierarchies and spatial and social segregation of Indian culture, by not communicating, if you don't communicate with different 
levels of people then that conveys power and authority but look what they missed they just wanted to say sorry so a lot of the problems were when it came to village the local people were completely easily resolved they were you could negotiate them you could get around it the problems were really outside that bubble So did the people who um, who fabricated and, and built portions of your zone, did they live on, on site there or did they live no, on site? No, nobody during nobody the construction? Yeah, nobody lived on site. That was one of the major points. Uh, before starting the project, I did a lot of research on construct on how on construction practices in India and the way people are made to live on building sites. Um, and the health and safety issues of that, and the exploitation that comes with it was one of the things that um, I wanted to tackle in the construction. So it was very important. We employed only local people and everybody went home at five o'clock. So nobody lived exactly. on the construction site. Um, and that was, that was very good because it, you know, it was, it was, it, it made it, it created a sense of creating an ethical building site. For us, it's, it's normal. We are in, in the UK and the US, we have re regulations controlling this. But in India, you, you create buildings, as you know, you know, it's, it's all hours of the day. So right, crea right. creating an ethical building site was, was very, very key. And I think that's where a lot of the values and ethos of our project were really put into practice. In the well, it's interesting that it's such it's such a better kind of point of pride that people would would be willing to resort to violence if they felt that their their creation everything they invested in was being diluted and uh, not being built with professional standards and so kind of bringing everything up to a, a mark that everyone felt comfortable with what was yes. incredibly important yeah we have we have different sorts of criteria that make it more challenging. You can see these things take seven, eight years to do that. We also have union versus non-union issues. We have issues of uh, fighting to be first in line to get your, your unit. You can, all these things are really done with a okay. lottery system. You know, there's three, 400 people trying to get 55 different slots and it's a tax credit project, which in the, in the state or low income tax credit that has to stay at a low rate for rent for 30 years. And then the developer gets really reimbursed by the federal government. But after 30 mm -hmm. years, these units become market rate. And so they get opened back up again. So it's a different, a different methodology of working. Did you face any pressures? Um, I'm talking, I mean, I'm thinking more about the land now, your site. Did you have any sort of competition or pressure from local developers? Um, you know, was, it, was, there, was there any sort of market pressures you had to face? Well, I think that's a good question. I think a lot of this has to do with the politics. As you said, I think this certainly could have been sold to a developer and it could have become uh, market rate housing, et cetera. But I think because this was donated to a not-for-profit community, you, you, you curried some votes by the constituents by giving the land away to a not-for-profit developer to be something big. And I have to say, even though it's on a form of sewage treatment facility that we've reclaimed, it is adjacent to the to where all the trash trucks and recycling trucks go. So it's not okay. going to be a, a super a wonderful destination for market rate housing, but it's definitely a great place if you can acoustically screen it away from where uh, a waste hauling uh, facility is. So I think everything kind of finds its place, but by far trying to figure out, I'm glad as, it, you know, as an architect, it sounds like you had a better role here. Role. Yeah. We, we didn't help to have to choose the people, but once the people were chosen, we really wanted to work with them to figure out how could they be part of the process and really come up with a design yeah. that, that they could feel proud of. Was there any scope for, it, for local people to design the interior layout of the units to make changes? I mean, are they, are they, is it a flexible layout? They, everyone commented on it. Everyone really okay. knew and helped us find that it was a very fluid space it wasn't a defined living room or a defined bedroom okay. it, it, was a, it was a it was a work space that had high ceilings people do sculpture uh people need spaces to vent uh crafts if they're doing you know welding or ceramics or things like that so all that kind of influenced the design and we did create three-dimensional drawings for them to see and comment on it in an effort to do that and 
I, I think what I really like about this project is the, the private spaces to make spaces, the community spaces to share ideas, and then the kind of marketplace that threads through it where you can both sell your wares and, and even uh, create potential partnerships where a ceramicist and a jewelry maker can kind of work together, uh, et cetera. I think that's, that creates unique communities. And when people move out, other people move in. So it's, it's right. an ever-changing kind of place to uh, and, and make it a real destination, which is pretty wonderful. Well, I think that's the thing. If you, if you, obviously, when we design as architects, we have a particular use a user group in mind or a focused user group. But when buildings have a life of their own after completion, which we we're not able to control, we've got no say in it. And right. if it if it's a resilient design, it will adapt. It will attract other user groups, other usage, attract different layers of meaning, which we all have to embrace. And I think that's that is a sign of success. So if your units are actually um, you know, if you have a different mix of people, is that what you foresee to see a different user groups and a different mix of people in there at some stage? Right. I think you, you uh, I don't know exactly the words you chose, but, you know, we're, we're architects, we have a role to a point and then we have to let it go and let the building yeah. have a life of its own. But That's I right. think it's great for us to come back a year from now, five years from now and see what, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? What could we yes, do better? Yes. And really get feedback, feedback from the users to really figure out the next project we do like this, how would we make it evolve and how would we keep it not so static, but that there's a chance for the yes. occupants to make a real difference and, and allow it to grow um, organically. I'm really hesitant to interrupt your discussion because it's been really interesting listening to you both compare as the projects and, and you know, ask each other questions. So thank you um, for sharing some more information about, um, yeah, about the details of the challenges you face. And uh, it's been very interesting to listen to that. I'm just aware there are a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. Um, the first being uh, for Jatine, have you had any requests for projects similar to Sharon Am? I know we've spoken about it uh, being a model before, but could you maybe um, expand a bit on that? Yes, I've had um, a, a number of projects um, and they are basically what I do, what I get is clients who work either, who are basically nonprofit, um, community-based, um, schools, uh, or even private, private clients who own land and they want to do something with the community. And I do, I, I, I have had, um, we do have live projects in the office. The question is always, it's a marriage between the client's aspirations and the communities in mind. And that sometimes that has to be worked out quite early. Um, the projects, there are projects in India to do with an orphanage, a, a shelter for mental health, which is an equally disturbing local context to work on the ground. There's a, there's a, there's a sports facility in Northeast India, which is in the middle of China, India, Burma, Tibet. So culturally in the middle of everything where it was a sports facility for a school. But when we looked at the local community, the local area, we found that in a town, in a city of a million people, there was not a single playing field or even a place to walk for people. So it's become a community sports facility. And there are projects in different parts of the UK and in Ireland where we're looking at opening up private land for the health and well-being of local communities. And that is something which is happening post-COVID. People um, recognize the value of being outside and not being trapped in their homes. All of these projects involve communities. They're all different. The sites are very challenging and the aspirations are um, kind, of, kind of hard to define and attain. I have to say that. Everything's at a very early stage, but there have been projects. But they're tough, as Sam was saying, these projects, when, when you deal with communities, projects are, oh, you're talking long-term long projects. projects. You're talking 10 years. Yeah, exactly. And I suppose similar question for Sam. Do you think you could take Siley Yard and uh, apply some of the, even if it's just the methodologies, the ways of working, um, do you think that there'll be kind of space for that to be applied to other community projects in the future? I completely appreciate that this is a, not a quick 
overnight <laughs> process. It takes years and years of planning and uh, working with the community, um, which is you know, such an uh, crucial point, really. Uh, absolutely, uh, I think this is a great opportunity to continue to think about this. We're um, we're not working on a housing project right now in the Philadelphia area, but we're working on a school called Youth Build. Uh, it is a school to teach young high school dropouts uh, the building trades, uh, including uh, masonry, uh, uh, metal fabrication, uh, carpentry, etc. And they're in this school. It's an adaptive reuse of, a, of an empty electric substation about having the kids actually do the majority of the work fitting out this this school because as you can imagine some urban schools there's issues of vandalism and there's truancy etc and i think if you can teach urban youth that have been marginalized and are not getting the opportunities they deserve to learn a, a trade uh, to make them employable and have their own families etc this gives them a chance to actually make a difference and create this sense of pride and dignity that we've been talking about i really I think in the United States, especially, there's been a loss of interest in vocational training. Uh, everyone, you know, quote, needs to go to college, and that it doesn't work for everybody, nor should it work for everybody. I think we have devalued plumbing, HVAC, carpentry, masonry, et cetera, and we need to bring those trades back and make them something that's valued and valuable and uh, make sure those people have a chance to build their own communities uh, so that they can contribute and, and create a more equitable place. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. And that actually um, goes very smoothly, transitions very nicely into our next question, which is about local skills being lost. That's something we talked about uh, today already. But how can we encourage young people to stay in an area to take up old trades, whether they're, you know, traditional like tile making in Jatine's case? You know, how how do we encourage people to to get involved in those kind of things? Question for both of you. <laughs> There's got to be an incentive. There's got to be an incentive. There's got to be a purpose for learning those skills. So it could be anything from being a trade which is respected and valued by society through um, salary. I, I, I always tell the story of when I was working in London before I did this project in India. Um, the site foreman used to turn off on a 200,000 pound Ducati motorbike and I used to take the bus. If, if you have skills in the construction industry, you will be handsomely rewarded. Um, but you may not be seen, it may still be regarded as a dirty job. Yeah. So I think somewhere society has to value the act of making, whether whatever it is, whether it's masonry or woodwork or, or being a car mechanic, you need those skills and they have to be valued by society. But like Sam says, um, going to college seems to be the be all and end all. Yeah, well, I think yeah. the creation of mentors, mentors and role models are, are huge. If people grow up with an understanding of an appreciation of family structure and somebody they can rely on, all the recruiting that we can do is going to be lost. I think having somebody come to your school and try to recruit you into a, a trade school is, is really important, but if you don't understand the value of getting up at 6 a.m., showing up to a job site at 7 a.m., it, it's going to be challenging. I think that's what we're seeing, and I think it's very important to see the success at the, at the end of the rainbow. I mean, I have it with my own kids. Like It's taken them years to wake up on time and get ready to go, but maybe if you have a Ducati motorcycle at the end of it, that's the, that's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow to look forward to. <laughs> no, definitely. But I think it all plays into this idea of resilience as well, doesn't it, really? You know, how can you keep a, a community resilient? And it has, there has to be some kind of longevity with all these things we've been talking about, things being carried forwards. Um, and Michael was saying earlier, going into the future, facing forwards, not backwards, which I think is such a great quote from today's uh, workshop. Um, I, do have I, another, I do have another point yeah. on that, Flora, if I can yeah, just go on. jump in. Yeah. It's the, this is where mat materials and the way society thinks of materials uh, becomes key because in a place like where you have if you have an aspirational society like India uh, which has become sort of modern overnight and people have become very rich modern modernity means concrete now it doesn't mean concrete in the way it's used in the UK or the US in very fine ways uh, very lean and even sustainable ways it just means masses of concrete so you make a modern building that will last for 50 years and when it rains you know it doesn't leak 
It's solid. It's not going anywhere. It's, it's an investment and concrete is seen as a trusted investment as a material. Something like earth is considered old fashioned. Those, those roof tiles I showed in, in the presentation, they are perfect in terms of climate. They're aesthetically beautiful. Local people think of those as backwards. Um, nobody wants to make them. I mean, just think about it. The whole of South India was covered in those roof tiles and I found one person after going for a hundred miles village to village who could still make them. And that's in 20 years. And they, traditional materials are just considered, uh, I mean, backwards. It, it's a status thing. And somehow we have to crack that the materiality we have to crack. Yeah, I think a lot of it is to do with mindset, doesn't it? And educating people and making people more aware, you know, of these things. And um, that's actually a theme that's been running through today's workshop, you know, changing mindsets, education, keep coming back to those kind of points. Um, Orish, I don't know if there's anything before we wrap up, because uh, I'm aware of the time that we're due to have a, a, a very short break, and then we'll be uh, continuing with our next topic area um, with Greg's presentation. So I'll just hand over to Orish before we um, stop for that break. But thank you both from me. It's been really interesting. That is was very interesting. Also in the context of our workshop that we started in the morning with the general frame with Khalid, that we went on the mindset deepening issue with Alessandro Scarfi as regards our heritage in terms of mindset. And now in contrast and as a complementation that we will con we continued with your two very concrete projects how to really build up community so at least to try it no? so this is a very it's a very good continuation we will uh, after and many thanks for this no? last but at least many thanks for your both for this because uh, the work also of our working group is living from these concrete projects no? and uh, before we continue uh, Going into our break, uh, I want to announce the third concrete project. This is, uh, as Flora indicated, it in, uh, is a large system. So if you consider it in a formal way, you uh, had case studies of two smaller scale systems, which were successful. Now we are looking in a plant, in the, we are looking into the future, into a very large system, the New Orleans Bayou region, comprising many, many, many different communities and uh, a high degree of complexity as regards a large system. Your, your approaches were already quite complex in a local concentration, so to say. And now we have the comparison. What happens if we have a plan and a plan for a very large system in comparison? Yeah, lots to look forward to there. So we'll be continuing that discussion just after our five minute break. So I hope you can all stay around and thank you again um, on behalf of everyone here and everyone on Zoom um, to Jatine and Sam for your presentations. So see you all in five minutes. So I make that 20 past three, then it's time. <laughs> all right, see you in shortly then. Thank you.